Coming up, a Kansas court delivers a blow to the Roberts campaign. We have the latest on the U.S. Senate race in Kansas and new revelations in the race for governor. Plus, we plunge into the campaign for the Kansas 3rd Congressional District. Also this half hour, after fighting so long to get his light rail proposal on the November ballot, why Clay Chastain is now asking you to vote no. And why Kansas City police are being forced to pick up the pieces in a broken mental health system. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes. A special focus on mental health later in the program, but first to our reporter roundtable. Joining us is Garrett Hake, who is on the political beat at 41 Action News. Kansas City star reporter, columnist and blogger Dave Helling. And star columnist, UMKC journalism professor and the host of Up to Date on KCYFM. Steve Kraske. Now, as this is a week in review, it should be pointed out that it was the Kansas City Royals stealing the headlines this week, lifting the collective psyche of the city with it in ending a 29-year playoff drought. A rider with the USA Today described the Royals' wild card game against Oakland as the most exhilarating in playoff history. The Royals continued to dazzle later in the week, taking the first game against the Angels, pulling off another improbable win. Now, we're not a sports show, of course. We concentrate on bigger political issues on this program, and there were a lot of those this week, beginning in Kansas, where the cloud surrounding the U.S. Senate race finally cleared in a three-judge panel meeting in Topeka ruled that Democrats do not have to nominate a replacement candidate for Chan Taylor, who abruptly removed himself from the race last month. Hours later, a possible appeal was dropped and the state ordered local officials to print ballots and prepare voting machines. The end of the ballot dispute means Kansas voters now know their major choices in November, incumbent Republican Senator Pat Roberts and independent Greg Orman. But does this decision doom the Roberts for Senate campaign or is Orman losing his luster now that prospective voters are learning more about him, Garrett? It doesn't doom the Roberts campaign, but what it does is set the tone for the next month and a half. We're going to see a very negative campaign on television, on the stump, and really across the state now because you look at what's happening in this race. People are settled about Pat Roberts. They know who he is. They've known him for a long time. But Orman remains a mystery figure, and Pat Roberts and Republican super PACs and, and, and everyone else who's going to get involved on that side are going to make absolutely sure they're going to fill in every blank they possibly can on Greg Orman in as negative a light as they possibly can between now and November 4th. But the Roberts campaign must have been totally fuming by this court decision this week. Well, they weren't happy about it. The polls seem to suggest, Nick, and you can't put too much stock in these things, but about a seven-point swing in Orman's favor here. He's up by seven points in a one-on-one -on -one matchup with Pat Roberts if you examine uh, an average of a, of a whole series of polls. So they're not happy about this. At the same time, and Garrett just alluded to this, you know, Greg Orman really does face a huge challenge as we head down the stretch here. Kansans don't know who he is, and he's going to have to figure out a way to get a little bit more of himself out there, let people know more about who he is. He was in the Stars editorial board on Monday, and I asked him, what's the, what's the game plan here, heading down the stretch? How are you going to get yourself out there? And he didn't seem to have any magic answers here, any magic bullets, but uh, we'll see how it plays out. People don't know who he is, but we did see a story just recently, Dave Helling, that uh, this is a man who, if he goes to the Senate, would be the fifth richest senator on Capitol Hill. He's a very wealthy Does man. that play well with voters? Because he is a self-made man. This is not someone who inherited all of that wealth. Right. He, he uh, in essence, runs an investment fund. He's had a, you know, a varied uh, business career, and he's made some point of that uh, on the campaign trail now. His business associations may become an issue. The Roberts campaign is really pushing this connection with a guy named Rajat Gupta, who is a, uh, uh, was convicted of insider trading violations. Um, Garrett and, and Steve are right. Here's the problem for Pat Roberts with a month to go, basically a month to go. He's still stuck at 40, 41, 42 percent in the polls in, in a state where everyone knows who he is. If he, and, and by the way, the libertarian Randall Batson has less than 1 percent in the latest poll. So it's really Orman Roberts. Pat Roberts has to figure out a way to get votes away from Greg Orman and back into his camp uh, as a candidate who everybody knows. So the only way to really do that is to make Orman the issue, and I think that's what we'll see in the last four weeks. Uh, and we'll see if it, it, it works out. That's, that's really what the dynamic is going to be. The Roberts campaign has to be very careful on how they approach this businessman and money issue with Greg Orman. Uh, 
you can't name the other four wealthy people in the Senate. I doubt anyone at this table can. The fact that he would be in that top five I don't think is especially relevant. But the Orman campaign would absolutely love to talk about Greg Orman, the successful businessman, versus Pat Roberts, the politician. So there's an element of danger in attacking his business record, particularly for a Republican, because I, su I suspect that there's someone in an opposition research shop at the Orman campaign looking up all the nice things Pat Roberts said about Mitt Romney's business record and how valuable it was that he was out there in the U.S. economy making money and creating jobs that will show back up if those attacks go too far. Steve, you know, when we talk here, Nick, about how negative this campaign might become, there's a giant caveat here. That caveat really does center on independent Greg Orman. Because he's an independent, he really is a little bit, his hands are tied in terms of how negative he can go. He wants to come across as something different, as a new style, new breed of politician. If he slings the same old mud the same old way, he'll be the same old politician. And that's exactly the image he does not want to portray here. The other thing that I think is very interesting with a month to go is, I think we all expected and still expect to some degree an, a, a, an onslaught of outside money in this race. But it really hasn't materialized yet. There's been, particularly in the general election, hundred or a million dollars, seven hundred fifty thousand to a million dollars. That's not a lot of money in a in a crucial Senate race. What we really want to do, Nick, is keep an eye on outside groups, American Crossroads, or you know the uh, Senate groups coming in uh, on Robert's behalf. Much more difficult on Orman's behalf because he is an independent, doesn't have that sort of infrastructure from the Democratic Party. That's a dynamic we need to watch as well. And some of those outside groups are poking around. Uh, some of my sources in, in national Republican circles are trying to figure out what the angle is on Greg Orman because they haven't yet found a handle to really go after him on one specific issue that they think can sink right. him. And, and as always, if you spend money in Kansas, that's money you can't spend in Iowa. You can't spend in North Carolina. You may not be able to spend in Arkansas or Kentucky, other states that Republicans have to have. So they're okay. trying to make a judgment as to whether to invest in this no, race. Well, we've been off the air for two weeks on this program. The Kansas governor's race has not skipped a beat. Paul Davis, Governor Brownback's Democratic challenger, having to answer reports about his presence with a topless dancer at a strip club that was raided by police in the 1990s. Brownback, meanwhile, having to answer questions about how his economic transformation is working as the latest state tax collection numbers just released for September show a drop of $21 million below projections. It marks the fourth time in the past six months revenue failed to match targets. Which appears worse, though, in the public's mind? Are these tax numbers too much like inside baseball? Or do average voters pay attention to them? Or isn't it easier for voters to form an impression of Paul Davis based on the strip club incident, Steve? Well, you know, the strip club thing, uh, you, you, people talked about it a little bit. We have had a poll or two that's come out since that story broke. He doesn't seem to be faltering too much. Paul Davis, not too much in the polls here. We've, all, we've also had some new economic numbers coming out that show that revenue is not rebounding, that that pattern is continuing in Kansas. And I think you have to look at the polls here a little bit, Nick. You have an incumbent governor of Kansas, much like Senator Pat Roberts, still is stuck in the low 40s here in terms of uh, support among Kansans. That's a really precarious place to be for an incumbent, whether it's the governor, whether it's the incumbent senator. You know, standard political science uh, logic would tell you that if you're a month before an election and you're stuck in the low 40s as the incumbent, you're probably going to get beat. But there's still a lot of time before the election, yes. and can't Sam Brownback be still making a lot of claims, though, about who this man by the name of Paul Davis is? And because of uh, issues and things that have been said on the campaign, he could be saying things like, oh, he could consolidate schools, he would raise your taxes, and he's been saying things like that, and he has the money to put those into campaign ads, and, Gary. And, and Sam Brownback and Pat Roberts are playing from the same playbook here a little bit because they're both facing guys in their uh, opponents here who are fairly uh, poorly known, and Paul Davis is something of a blank slate. And Brownback has the bully pulpit, he has the money, and we've seen now the ads, the RGA, the Republican Governors Association, went up with an ad about the strip club issue earlier this week. It's low politics. It's probably not the kind of thing that's going to ultimately decide anyone's vote or not. But because Paul Davis is so ill-defined, you can get a lot of bang for your buck getting something like that to stick to him. Whereas, the, to your point about inside baseball, the tax numbers on Brownback, it's one other number, it's one other thing that's hard to follow, and it's another drip in this same narrative that's been out there for several months, and it may not catch in the voter's mind who says, yeah, okay, I already know there's tax issues in Kansas, but 
they may not be able to turn that over into some usable information. We'll, Dave. we'll want to look back at the end of the election season to see how this all plays out, Nick. But one of the fascinating dynamics for me is it, it seems as if the Pat Roberts, Greg Orman race has sucked some of the oxygen away from Davis Brownback. H had Davis yeah. Brownback been a standalone race, and the strip club story uh, come out. You, you might have seen more attention to it, but you do get the sense that, that that story flopped a little bit, primarily because we're all paying so much attention to the court battle over Orman and Roberts, uh, you know, the Democrats on the ballot, plus the dynamics of that race. So, uh, and I tried to write a little bit of a story this week about how, in, fascinatingly, Roberts and Brownback are sort of connected, but sort of apart. You know, the geometry of this race is absolutely fascinating. And, and, and th again, that's what we'll be watching. In the How last about few weeks. these two races sucking the oxygen out of every other campaign that's happening no, in our question. region? In other news from the campaign trail this week, the Democratic candidate trying to unseat Kansas 3rd District Republican Congressman Kevin Yoder released her first TV ad of the campaign. Former Wyandotte County State Senator Kelly Coltilla takes aim at a two year old incident in which Yoder took to swimming naked in the Sea of Galilee during a congressional fact-finding trip to Israel. A while back, Congressman Yoder made news by skinny dipping on the job. But it's more shameless what he's doing to Kansas. The naked truth is Yoder voted to cut Medicare for seniors. Proposed a raise for Kansas workers. And stripped education funding for Kansas schools. But Yoder lines the pockets of his millionaire donors with big tax cuts. And they line his when he has pockets. Now, a story on the national political site, Politico, describes Kultilla, though, as a long-shot Democratic challenger. Does the ability to buy a multi-week broadcast and cable buy with this message alter her odds against Yoda? I don't think so, and I don't think this ad's going to help her cause very much at all. I, I find the ad embarrassing and a little bit insulting. It's an old incident. We've sort of been uh, water under the bridge here. We've sort of digested this thing. Kevin Yoder, it doesn't seem to be in very bad political shape at all. I think he's going to win this race and win it easily. And that ad's not going to help. Garrett? It makes a bit of a splash, if you'll forgive the pun, but mostly this ad is destined for some Washington Post or Politico top 10 ads of the campaign yeah. season. Some consultant will get a pat on the back and maybe a little check for it, but I don't anticipate it influencing Okay, well, back election. to Kansas City, Missouri now, and after waging an exhaustive and successful legal battle to get the city to put his light rail issue on the ballot, Maverick transit activist Clay Chastain announces this week he is opposing the very measure he fought for. Chastain is now campaigning against a pair of questions that will appear on the November 4th ballot in Kansas City, Missouri, and urging voters to vote no. Can you explain this to me, Dave? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. No. Uh, it, it, you know, Clay Chastain is the capital M mystery of our time, is he not? Uh, I mean, his argument is that there is no defined use for this money, that the city council will somehow uh, somehow hijack the cash if it passes for something that he doesn't want to do. So, you know, Kansas Cityans just have to sort of judge Clay and judge his proposals on their merits, and, and we'll go forward one way or another. Now, I had set aside October 24th on this program for a debate on this light rail issue. Do I no longer have a show, Garrett? I'm no. sure we'll come up with something else oh, to we, talk we, about. We, we think we will? Okay. You don't have a show. No. I don't have a it's show. Over. Yeah. Clay Chastain is a force of nature. He's like a tornado of politics. He cannot be explained by our current levels of science. But I do think his general point here is probably true. In the way that that ballot language was written, there's no guarantee that a yes vote, that that money would go to anything like the proposal he had in place. So, so no, no light rail, and we're going to, and certainly we found out earlier this year that we were not going to have any streetcar expansion in Kansas City. In a related transit development this week, we learned that the Joe, the bus service in Johnson County, which is now merging with the Kansas City Area Transportation Authority, Johnson County will eliminate its 11-person transportation department in this move, which they say will save half a million dollars a year. Johnson County broke away from Kansas City's bus service more than 30 years ago amid concerns about how money was being spent and issues of trust. So is this a positive symbol of bi-state cooperation that we don't see very often, Dave? Well, uh, it is. Um, you know, how far it goes we're, it isn't completely clear yet. I think some of this was involved in Mark Huffer's decision to step aside at Kansas City ATA. But we've talked about uh, on this show for what seems like decades now the need for Kansas City to have a more comprehensive public transit plan. 
this may be a step in that direction. And it may, the most important thing, Nick, is that it reflects the idea that people are thinking about this, that in the current environment, it is just not efficient to run three or four different bus services. And it, 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 that's sort of the first step, the first hurdle. Now we'll see how far it goes. I think it's a very positive development. I, I think it is a signal here that suddenly Johnson County can work with the Missouri side of the state line. You don't see that very often. There is a new sense of trust here. It's a new way to gain some efficiencies and coordinate a system that badly needs some coordination. Today. Garrick. Yeah, the culture of public transportation is still really not present in the metro, but if it's ever going to exist and work in a meaningful way, it has to be regional. You cannot have three or four different sort of Byzantine systems trying to get people around the city. If it's ever going to work, it has to be coordinated. Next thing you know, we might see streetcars in Johnson County then, based on this. All right. Don't hold your breath. All righty. That's where we leave it. You can listen to Steve Kraske every day from 11 to noon weekdays, keeping you up to date on KCUR-FM. Garrett Haight keeps you abreast of political matters on 41 Action News, and you can rely on Dave Helling to have an accurate read on the most important, significant political and public policy matters in our region when you pick up your copy of the Kansas City Star. Thank you all. Next up, Kansas City Police and the Mentally Ill. It's a surprising story, and it's in the Week in Review Spotlight straight ahead. In the first six months of this year, the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department took nearly 1,300 calls regarding people who were suicidal. On average, that's around seven calls a day. And dealing with patients with untreated bipolar disorder and schizophrenia have become routine. In a new local documentary, KCPT aired this week, we took a closer look at the growing role Kansas City Police are now playing as they try to pick up the pieces in a broken mental health system. One night in June earlier this year, officers Charles Owen and Jason Cote are on patrol in the south of the city when a call comes in. Male with the bus stop threatening suicide. Who was it? There's an ambulance in the house, six strangers. They've dealt with this man before. A fire truck and an ambulance also attend as part of the emergency medical response. What's going on with this guy is he's having a lot of anxiety issues. He's got some medical issues as well. He's feeling depressed and he said he's just at his wit's end. Charles' search for weapons extends to the man's briefcase. There he finds evidence this isn't the first time he's been in crisis. Most of these are actually files from when he's been discharged from a hospital. They'll take him to a publicly funded facility where he'll be given another mental health evaluation. Meanwhile, Charles finds out some more about him. So with this individual, uh, I ran his name and date of birth on his identifiers, and I found out he actually has two warrants right now also. He has uh, one Kansas City warrant for telephone harassments and another one for Kansas City for uh, display of a deadly weapon. This is definitely an individual we don't need out sitting at a bus stop with other people. It's a mother who called about her 10-year-old son who's out of control and tearing up the house. Using his CIT training, John will calm the boy down. Then he speaks to the mother. And they told me he has to be uh, wanting to hurt himself or hurt somebody. Well, the fact that he's pushing the other kids around. Yeah. She tried to get her son into a residential facility before this latest incident, but was told he wasn't dangerous enough. He threatened to jump out the car, you know, while the car was moving. I got him home. He didn't calm down. What he did, I went upstairs. He came up there, started shoving the other kids into the back of the door, just getting violent. Her son has been prescribed a medication, but she can't get him to take it. She can't treat him at home. I would like to see him get into some kind of facility, get him kind of calm down and get some kind of control over his life so everybody feels safe. An excerpt from Lost Minds, KC's mental health crisis, which you can see again Sunday at 4 here on KCPT. I'm joined now by the filmmaker and reporter Michael Price. Uh, also here is the executive director of the Kansas City chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, Gaila Stidman, and Kansas City, Missouri City Councilman Scott Wagner, who's been trying to work on fixes to this problem at City Hall. I want to start with you, Michael, though. But we got 100,000 people in our metro, according to the documentary, with serious untreated mental illnesses. What type of training are police getting to deal with all of that? This is called the Crisis Intervention Team Program, and it's, um, it comprises 40 hours of training for a week. 
um, teaching the police how to de-escalate a situation when they come across someone in, in a mental health crisis. It teaches them the sort of questions they should be asking as well to find out what that person's condition is. Are they suffering from schizophrenia? Are they suffering from a bipolar disorder, for example? And then what sort of medication they're on, what that medication might be doing to them, and then what to do next with that person. Gaila, we invited you on the program because we wanted you to see the, the show. We, what, what did you think of the documentary, first of all? I thought it was wonderful. <clears throat> it, um, it, it talked a lot about the crisis situation that we have going on here, which is it, it's a huge crisis that we have. People are not able to get services, and they reach that crisis period. And Michael did a, a wonderful job, and all of the officers and and consumers that were on there. I thought it was, was very enlightening. I think people will be very um, scared by that. I don't, I don't think people realize the level of crisis that we have here around mental illness. One of the questions, though, is, while we outline the issue, what do we actually do about it? Scott Wagner at City Hall, one of the issues has been, you know, where do police take people who have some serious mental health conditions? Mm -hmm. You can either take them to jail, which is not an appropriate place for them, where they're not going to get necessarily treatment, taking them to the already overburdened ERs, which is not necessarily an appropriate place either. Right. You've looked at a third way, which is a crisis stabilization center right. that the city should set up. What's been the progress in doing that? Well, I th the progress over the last year has really been twofold. Um, one is good, one not so good. The, the one part that's good is we've been bringing people around the table, everyone from the municipal court, uh, represented by our presiding judge, uh, Lacasio, uh, our, uh, our various hospitals that deal with this population, our police department, our, our ambulance service that transports many of these people, uh, to really begin to create that strategy. And, and all of that's good. The, the part that is challenging is how do you pay for a, a, a system like that, a center like that, uh, even looking at other systems, whether they be in Kansas City, Kansas, or San Antonio, or other parts of the country, uh, we have great models to choose from. Unfortunately, they all cost a, a pretty good amount of money. How does that solve the problem, though? Well, I think what it does is it allows a, a, a one point of contact uh, by which whether someone um, comes into the system through the police department or they come through our ambulance service or they or they just happen to to want some help and they just want a place to go uh, that uh, stabilization center is a point of triage where you begin to figure out what does that person need uh, do they need to go back on their meds do they need to re, uh, come back to their family you know what is the the system or what is the the solution that can help that person get on the right track and having that one point of contact Michael mm -hmm. I think the problem with all due respect councilman Wagner is that we're looking at this issue from the wrong end we're focusing in on the people who have had crisis mm -hmm. and you're talking about a system to meet those people's needs once they're in crisis what needs to happen is that the system the, the, the care system needs to be um, addressed further downstream if you like mm -hmm. to the point that those people are not then hitting crisis Nick the the issue is this in, in Kansas City there is a gap between treatment and the people who need it the figure has been put at nearly 100,000 people in the greater Kansas City area suffering from a serious mental illness who are not in treatment. There's a gap. And the other issue is this, further downstream, that they are not receiving the treatment that they need. When they get the treatment because of the lack of resources, the treatment is not fixing them. Nick, just very quickly on this, if I may. Last year, on the, on the Missouri side of the city, 2,440 CIT re re reports were written by the police. 2,440 CIT reports were written by the police for people who'd hit a mental health crisis. Of those people, nearly half, 1,200, were apparently on prescribed medication. They were in the system. But it's not enough to give those people a bottle of pills, a pat on the back, and expect them to be fixed. But, but it was amazing to me in the documentary how many people that the police encountered were on medications or being prescribed medications, but were simply not treating them. And we did hear also from caseworkers saying, Gaila, that uh, even if the prescriptions yes. were paid for and they were getting them for free, patients weren't taking them. One, one of the analogies that I like to use when I try to explain why people do not take their medications if you had an opportunity to get treatment today that um, 20 years from now might keep you from having a heart attack mm -hmm. or a stroke, but yet it made you impotent or it made you gain weight, 
would you take the chance of taking that medication or treating exactly the way you feel today? That's what happens with individuals that do not take their medication. The side, effect, side effects are so horrendous that what ends up happening, and they're better than they used to be, but there's still side effects there. And so people are saying, um, okay, sex today, 20 years down the line I'm going to live, which one do you, you know, do? And I, I don't may, mean to make light just by saying sex. That's, a, that's a, just one side effect. There are a lot more. People do not feel like they're themselves. Uh, and it does not always stop the voices. It doesn't stop all of the, the indications of, of the, um, and conditions of the mental illness. So you, they're no different. We do it every day when we stop taking our antibiotics, whenever it's halfway through because we feel better even though the doctor says you need to take all of them. How many of us still have antibiotics in our, in yeah. our medicine mm -hmm. cabinet? This is an extremely complex problem. We, when we, we got a great response to the documentary, we outline the issue, but there are still issues of, you know, what, are, what is the solution to this? There's no quick fix. There's no quick fix. And there's no cheap fix to this. There's no cheap, cheap fix either. But what I would say, Nick, is this. One thing that we did highlight in the, in the documentary of this, is this number of 100,000 people in the greater Kansas City area who have a serious mental illness for which they're not receiving treatment. It's been estimated that the cost of not treating those people per year for greater Kansas City is $624 million. And I surely, think that's low. Surely it would cost less than that amount to fix this, to mean that the treatment follows them into their own yes. homes. But the, a city, a state, has a lot of other issues to deal with. Mental health is not the highest priority, is it, uh, Scott Wagner? Well, I mean, there, there are competing interests, and I think the, the reality is, is that government, in this case, is not the entire solution. I think Michael's point uh, to me earlier is, is well taken. Um, is a crisis center the answer? Well, no, but it is part of what we as a city can do in the course of providing our services. But the solution itself has to be realized through a number of different parts. It's, it's city, it's state, it's providers, and it's the patients themselves who have to have the willingness to, to take what they need to take. But, but because of those competing interests, it is very difficult to get a commitment at every turn that's necessary to, to come up with a total solution, which I think is okay. your point. You're not giving up on the crisis stabilization center? Right. Okay, so that's still a possibility. That is still a possibility, and we will be working with the state and the Department of Mental Health again to hopefully get the funds we need to okay. make it happen. Michael, you spent a better part of the last year on this documentary. What was the biggest surprise for you in putting this together? The biggest surprise, Nick, is that here we are in the heart of America, in the can-do capital of America, uh, with its Midwestern values of hard work and community. And yet, 50 years or so after it was decided by this nation to back care, the care in the community model, we're having this debate. I was able to make that film showing that that system is still not working. This is a country that can do things, that solves problems. You'll find no better city in this country as an, exemp as an, an example of that than Kansas City. This is a problem that needs to be solved. In the words of Guyla there, if, it is scary at the moment. And we should be careful not to tiptoe around this issue of danger, the danger posed to us all. Uh, uh, we are not dancing here a, a, a ballet of political correctness. It is dangerous. Not everyone with a mental illness is dangerous, just to make that clear. Absolutely. But some of them are. Some of them are. And they need to be treated. Mm -hmm. And they need to be getting the right treatment to keep them safe, okay. to keep them um, leading fulfilled life, and to keep us safe. OK, quickly, Gaila. For, some, <clears throat> excuse me, for someone that has been in mental health for 40 years, I can tell you that the system has gotten better at times, but it has fallen back on the laissez-faire type of attitude that mental illness can take care of itself and it is a condition of behavior versus um, an illness, just like cancer and diabetes. So I, I've seen it go to the peak, back down to the interest. And one of the huge pieces that I think in order to support any kind of mental health care, we're going to have to look at Medicaid expansion. And that's been a huge political um, bailiwick now for a couple of years. Okay. 
Gaila Stidman with the Kansas City chapter of NAMI and Kansas City Councilman Scott Wagner, thank you. And thanks to our reporter, filmmaker and documentarian Michael Price. If you list, missed rather, Lost Minds this week on KCPT, another chance Sunday at 4 on KCPT. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.